Hi, I'm Seamless. And this is the full version of that intro. Minus the how to base stuff. Yeah. How cool was that? And I did that live. Because XSplit lets you do that. So that means I can have an intro and I don't have to worry about editing. That is very neat. Anywho. <laughs> Q7A. Is that like Avenged Sevenfold only? Quebec, Quebec sevenfold? I don't, I don't know. So, uh, let's do let's do some questions and stuff. I have I got the chat open. And when I go to the other pages and whatnot, we'll look at um the chat and we'll actually uh have it on screen like I did last time. But while we're while we're in discussion mode, where I I am yakking at the camera directly, we don't see the chat. <sighs> Do I have any tips for making your phase verb sound wonkier? Well, I have to imagine you can make it sound wonkier by doing wonkier things to it. That's my answer, and I'm sticking to it. I only, I only just now announced that we're streaming, which is a bit of my bit of my fault. So I gotta, you know, wait for people to show up before more questions happen. But in the meantime, all uh, twenty-two of you, twenty-four of you, I guess. We could discuss things. Let's see. Uh, NFL pogo settings makes kicks pitch up when you turn to the right. Why? Well, that's kind of what the pogo thing does. It kind of adds an automatic pitch modulation to something. So it goes, so if it were just like a do tone, it would go do. And certain settings can make it go do. It's it's pinging and ponging. It's going from one end to another in terms of pitch modulation. That's what it does. What are these things on the wall? Uh, those are. RLX foam panels. They're designed for uh, broom acoustic treatment. Acoustic treatment. I'm using them at the moment as uh, diffusers slash absorbers. More absorption than diffusion, but because of their shape, they do a little bit of diffusion, but it's mostly about absorption. And um, their purpose in life is to break up standing waves. And what is a standing wave? Well, a standing wave is when, because this room is a cube, I have parallel walls, and that means that there's a set, there's a, there's a distance between the walls. There's an actual size. And here's the thing about waveforms is that waveforms have a size. They have a measurable length, wave wavelengths. That's why they call them wavelengths. So this means that like a, there's a tone that fits exactly in the lengths of these two walls, these two walls, and the floor and the ceiling. And if I left them untreated, uh, they would they would actually they would be they would reinforce themselves they would bounce and they bounce back and it would fit and it would it would uh resonate that's what resonation is resonation resonating resonating that's what resonating is and so these fo these foam panels uh screw up the waves when they bounce back and forth preventing them from uh completing their period in the same length as as the other wave coming in because the whole point the whole point of all this and the reason why this is bad to not do this is because if you're listening to something and let's say uh, you're working on a track that's in C, right? And your room is tuned to C because it's the length of a, a C bass wave. And you play you play the song. It's gonna it's gonna sound like there's a lot of bass. It's because the the C note of your of your bass is gonna resonate, and so it's gonna sound like there's more bass than there actually is. And you can fix it by EQing your song, and so it'll sound right. But the thing is, though, is if you do that. Then you go listen to anywhere else that's not in your room, and it's going to sound bad or different. Not necessarily bad, but different. Not the way that you want it to sound. So that's why we do acoustic treatment to prevent um, those kinds of mixing room problems. And that's what these panels do. They help with that kind of thing. Ideally, I wouldn't be in a cube. I wouldn't have parallel surfaces, and I wouldn't have six walls. Well, five walls on the floor. So that's those are the ideals, and these things exist to kind of make the unideal a little bit more ideal. How do I stream in ASIO for all mode? Okay, so that question <laughs> that question is uh, loaded because what you're what you're what you're asking is probably a lot of things. You're probably asking like, why can't I only use one audio device at a time? When I'm ASIO for all for all mode, like oh, I can only use FL. I can't use my system audio. For my using system audio, I can't use FL. You're thinking that's your that's your question. That's why you're asking these things. But then you're also asking, well, if I'm running ASIO, things like XSplit and Skype and whatever don't accept the audio as being as something that you can route. And how do you do that? And there are there's software out there that helps you do this sort of stuff. Sort of stuff. Um, 
think uh, audio cables or something, patch cables, line audio cables, whatever. It's it's, audio, it's some kind of some kind of deal. But um, that they help you. It's it's a piece of software that lets you routing do routing internally. And I don't do that because I do routing physically, physically. And so what um, what I do is I have some outputs and I run them to my inputs and that's how I do all this sort of stuff. And eventually I'll do a tutorial about how that works for real. But one of the reasons why this works is because my ASIO interface, my audio interface, has a lot of extra outputs. And they're not just clones of the actual, of the main output. They're actually extra outputs that you can assign to things. And this means that I have, I have 10 outputs, which are two, two, you know, left and right each. So five stereo outs, which actually means I can run a maximum of five ASIO running things, which for me is usually the system audio and then four FLs. I can't, so if, I, if I'm running my system audio, like uh, YouTube and stuff and whatever, Windows, I cannot run more than four FL Studios. But if I was running my M Audio Fast Track Pro, which only has really one set of outputs, I can only run either the system audio or the FL. So that's most people's problems. Because the kind of interface I have is a little bit extreme for just making electronic stuff. I have it because I, do, I record bands as well, which is why I need it. But that is... That's that's what's up. Uh, Vista was pretty weird. Explain RoboStep bases. I don't know what RoboStep is. Also, that wasn't a question. How did I acquire my knowledge about sound designing? By designing sounds for 10 years. Um, a lot of the information that I know about stuff like synthesis is a combination of experience versus reading manuals versus a little bit of research because... Um, some people, uh, there's this idea in the high school that I went to, um, and, and in education in general, but, the, but in particular, the high school that I went to was particularly uh, gung-ho about exploring this, and this is the idea of alternate learning styles, or multiple learning styles. And what this means is that uh, for, for every person and for every kind of thing that a person will learn, they have different ways that speak the most to them about how they learn it. And a good example is I, I tend to learn more by doing than by reading. Like being told information and being shown stuff. I learn more by doing it myself and then being like, oh, that's how I learn. And so when, um, for like, for example, additive synthesis is really kind of a, it's a simple deal. Like it, the explanation for it is pretty straightforward. And I first looked up what the explanation was when uh, Morphine was a plugin that was new, which is an FL Studio additive synthesizer. And also the, the point called alchemy. Like I was like, oh, I added a synthesis. What is this? Ooh. And I go look up. Um, I don't think Wikipedia was out back then, but there's a, there is a thing. Google it. The Google was out back then. And so I'm looking up. What is that? And the basic explanation is is that added a synthesis is synthesizing a sound based on building it out of sine waves, sine wave harmonics in particular, in particular. And at the onset, you're thinking, oh, cool. So like if I just stack a whole bunch of sine waves together, it'll form a sound. That's neat. And um, the thing is, though, is that a lot of a lot of additive presets is all just like bells and stuff, just like weird sounding like organic instruments. And at the time, the um, the resynthesis qualities of, of additive synthesis were also still being touted, and they often demonstrated this by by doing tough to create synthetic sounds, which are usually stuff like guitars and pianos and organic sounding instruments. Which are really impressive, but even back then I was all into, into like you know bass and neuro stuff, and that was not a big help. Of course, it would have been a big help if I knew what I knew about added added this this. But back then I didn't quite grasp. I didn't really get like what that meant. Like I could I could logically explain to you what it meant, I just as well as I could logically explain. Oh, subtractive synthesis is synthesizing by having a sound and then taking away parts of the spectrum from it, like a filter or something. That's very obvious. Oh, that's subtractive synthesis. Cool. I've been doing that forever. Everyone's always been doing it because you've been, you've been doing it without really knowing what you're doing. It's you know a big part of life, but adding it to the system is a process. Of being like, cool, I have no reason to know that I ever need to do that, and it's not something I care about. And when Harmer came around, Harmer Harmer worked as well as it did because it didn't try to do things that were specific to added to the system. It did it did everything it could possibly do. That only you just did it without a synthesis, and so you're just going like, "Oh, oh, I see. It's built by sine waves. It's exactly what every, everything has ever said about it. Except now I actually know what it what it means when it says that. Like I actually, because I have a functional, like a literally a functional, practical understanding of it from having done it. 
And so that's, um, you know, you can learn stuff like that or you can, you know, do it yourself. And the same thing with, uh, with subtractive synthesis, because like I, subtractive synthesis is probably the most common, commonly used synthesis type. And it's even kind of intrin intrinsically involved in all the other synthesis types. Like, just in the way, the way that it works, you know, because just by using a filter, you're sort of uh, doing, doing subtractive synthesis. But the thing is, though, is that it's not super duper clear that something like Unison, like using Unison in a, in a thing to make a super saw, like a super saw, you think of a super saw, you're thinking, damn, just all the voices, like let's do let's do hundreds of voices, put them together, and you get a super saw. And you're thinking, how does that, how does that, how is that subtractive to this? Is you're adding voices, like how, is that added to this? And the reason why it's subtractive to this is because when you layer so many voices together, you're you're basically you're and you do different pitches and whatever, you're going to layer frequencies, the same frequencies in different phases, which means you're gonna get, you're going to get phase cancellation. It's not actually going to get louder. I mean, it's going to become like measurably louder, but you turn it down because you need, you need to be below a certain level. So that means the only functional change that you're going to get out of layering so many voices together is that you're going to lose stuff. You're going to lose frequencies. You're going to you're going to get face cancellation. You're going to see the EQ portion of it moving around or whatever. That's you're subtracting frequencies as, as a result of adding a whole bunch together in different phases. So like that's a core aspect of subtractive synthesis. And it's real interesting to, to think about. Uh, I take one synth to produce a song, Harmer. Uh, so what does that mean? You're a FL Studio guru guru. What? Um, well, the actual FL Studio guru is Scott Fisher. He's the guy that makes all the FL Studio tutorials that, that are on the website. What got me into Electro? Feed me. Uh, does ImageLand pay me? Nope. I mean, they have paid me for things. Like they paid me for the projects that are mine that are in there in FL's install file. That's what they they paid me for that, and they gave me this stuff for free. But they, I'm not actually employed by them, nor do I receive money for doing stuff for them. When you do volume automation, do you automate fader or main mixer? Do you automate by using volume fader or some kind of plugin effect or whatever? Uh, you have every option you can possibly think of. Some of them are similar, some of them are not. Um, the, some of the main differences between the volume options you get in FL are how they behave when you automate them. Like for example, when you automate the mixer fader, um, if you were to do a sharp automation, it's not actually that sharp. Like it's sharp enough for most applications, but it's not actually. You can't. You don't hear a snap. But if you were to automate. Um, like the main EQ fader in the EQ2, that might be a little bit snappy. If you automate volume inside a plugin, that might be a little bit snappy. Like they behave differently, but functionally they're all the same. They're all exactly the same. So there's that. How often do you change chord progressions in a song? Um, not usually. Uh, it's, it's actually more of a kind of a, a, a riffy metal thing to do is to kind of progress from one actual progression into another. But most of the time for like EDM related stuff, I kind of stick to a theme. I treat it like it's a theme. Like I create a progression and a melody together. And then it's usually what I end up doing. Um, some, some, exa some different examples, some sort of changes. You, can, you might, you might consider the, the relationship between the theme and the drop to be a change in progression. Cause you I mean, you are changing progressions most of the time. If you're not keeping the actual progression for the drop, which sometimes I don't, I'll stick to the tonic. Like if my song's an E and I'm doing a progression and everything's cool. And then here comes a drop. And now it's just E, 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 And then that's the drop. And then you go back to the progression. Like that's, that's, you know, a change in your progression. So you might call that one, you know, but it's not like a rule. Like you must change progression this many times to make a good song. Like it's not, it's not a thing. Greetings from Germany. Hi. How do you feel about acid 303s? I actually did use 303 once. Um, my teacher who uh, created the class that I found FL Studio in in high school, he had he brought in a bunch of synths. He's a big synth guy. He's huge hardware. He's like ambient trance, like Jean-Michel Jarre kind of guy. That's uh, That's like... That's his deal. So, like, he had a bunch of really cool hardware, like pieces of hardware, including a real TB303. And uh, I thought I thought that was neat. I thought it was cool. As far as, as, far, as far as its application as a genre, I'm, I'm not totally on board with that, but it's neat. Good VST for realistic orchestral sounds. This depends on what you're going to use them for. Um, 
if if I want to take your question at your face value of, of say, what's the best orchestra library? Then I'm going to tell you it's the East West Quantum Leap stuff. That's the best. Like actually, not even the Hollywood series, the Hollywood Hollywood strings, Hollywood brass, Hollywood woodwinds, and Storm Drum, Storm Drum Three. Like you get these three things, and you can make the most realistic shit ever. And they're also really goddamn expensive. Um, but if you're not actually, if you're not actually making, if you're not like rebuilding some like seriously or intricate like classical music, then like you don't really need those. Like if you're doing, if you're just gonna layer stuff on top of like electronic stuff, like uh, Codename Hurricane, for example, I probably could have done that without using East West, but I mean I just have used it. I, had, I have it, so I'm using it. But um, other options include the Basic Contact Orchestra Library. Like I've used that before, and it's functional. It's good. Does the job. Um, there's a little bunch of free options. Uh, one of them, my personal favorite free option, is a sound font called Squid Font Orchestral. Just Google it. Google Squid Font Orchestral, and you'll probably find it somewhere. It's a sound font. It's free. Doodads, how do you make them? You pitch modulate really high-frequency things. So it goes, pew. That's how you make it. How do I feel about FL Chan? I think it's hilarious. All right. Now they're fighting over FL Chan. Uh... Why did I, someone said, why, do I pick, why did I pick FL? I picked FL because I was given an option between FL Studio 3 and Reason 2. Well, back then it was called Fruity Loops 3, but I had that option. I tried both, and Reason didn't make any sense to me because I had, no, at the time, I did not really have any real technical engineering background. I had piano lessons. I played the piano. I had not done any recording. I had not done any synthesis so stuff. I had done not a single thing related to actual technical stuff. So that meant that I cannot make heads or tails out of Reason because Reason is designed to appeal to people who used, uh, you know, analog hardware setups and actual for real engineering and all that kind of good stuff, which makes a lot of sense. But at the time, it didn't appeal to me. So FL forever. I mean, there's other options now, or whatever. But I've used FL for so long that it actually doesn't matter if another DAW is better. It doesn't matter if someone could like quantifiably, objectively tell me and show me and prove that like Ableton's better because I am so used to FL's interface. And way of doing things that I am still I will still be faster and better using FL than I would be using anything else. So that's uh that's why I use FL. Now anyway. Uh what's the top of your wish list feature for FL? Okay, so here's the thing about wish lists is that I actually know a quite a, a big amount of stuff that's coming for FL that I, and I don't remember what's public knowledge and what's not public knowledge so I kind of I kind of sort of don't want to talk about that I don't know what an evoke base is but yeah you should probably keep the sound design requests until I do sound design requests Workflow is different for everybody. I mean, what appeals to some people aren't, aren't going to appeal to some other people. So this, is, this, is that, this is that idea, that idea of you know, learning styles. It comes from the same place about what makes us different. Have I tried the new FL12 Alpha? I have. It's very interesting. How do you feel about FL's lack of a good bit crusher? Well, I could just get Tau bit crusher if I needed a bit crusher. Uh, would you use the Axis Virus TI? It looks like an interesting synth. I haven't... Oh, see, okay. Remember... Let's, let's talk about... Let's talk about... Um, since for a second, not hardware, just just in general things that make sound. So, uh, so like earlier, I was talking about the kinds of th synthesis, like subtractive synthesis and FM and additive and all these things. And I was talking about like what they are, and I, I didn't really define them, but I just well, I did define them. But I just kind of was just like, oh, it's nice. And then if you think about, if you really analyze what each and every single plugin does at its core. Like they're all uh, saying that they're all the same is a bit of a is, is a bit incorrect, but at the core, s creating sound level, they're almost all the same. They're almost identical. They still do the same stuff. And so, like, why do you use different plugins? And it's mostly for their workflow. It's mostly like like why do why would you use something like uh um what's a good <laughs> I don't have a huge amount I don't have a huge list of examples because I stopped using most of them, but like. Um, okay, okay. If Massive didn't have any wavetables besides um, besides square, sine, and triangle, and saw, why would you use that over 3x OSC? 
Like, why? And the reason is because, oh, well, Massive has a bunch of built-in effects and it ha- has a bunch of routing options. It's got m- filters and cool stuff. Like, that's why you use that. And then, then you think, okay, well, why don't... I mean, you, you, at 3X OSC doesn't have half of that. It has some built-in filters and stuff like that. But, like, it doesn't have distortion and, or routing or any of that. So, like, why would you use that then again? Why would you use it? And it's kind of like when I was like, oh, I could use Tile Big Roger. I could, I could probably find all of the effects that Massive uses just externally kind of thing. And just someone even made the Dimension Expander, like, as a, as a separate plug- plugin. So, like, that's, you know, that's possible. So, there's kind of, again, why would you choose one over the other? And it's purely because of how you interact with that environment. Like, which one do you like better? And so, like, the virus. Let's talk about the virus. The hardware, like, that. there's, there's other reasons for using hardware stuff. Like, there's a couple of different benefits. But even in the hardware universe, why would you use one particular synth versus another? And for the hardware universe, it makes a little bit more sense because something that has built in this and that and the other thing, it makes it a little bit more difficult to get external versions of hardware things. And and that's sort of jazz. But like, unless I'm specifically going after something that's 100% in the realm of analog hardware, there's not a huge reason for me, someone who is mostly about the sound design core, or like going all the way down to the bottom level of, of stuff, there's not really a big reason for me to do that kind of stuff. I'm not saying you shouldn't, obviously. Multiple, multiple styles, you know. I I am all about the core, low, low level stuff. But um, again, like it's also a creativity thing because if you're using a piece of hardware, like using a piece of hardware or a synthesizer that's arranged differently, then even if you try to do something that you know how it's going to sound, if you do this, this, and A, B, and C, or whatever, the way that it's laid out and the way that the options are presented to you will cause you to do different things that you would not have thought of even if you had the whole world as an option. So, like, specific kinds of limitations can actually increase your creativity in certain regards. And this has probably been obvious to a lot of you if you've ever, like, if you've ever... uh you know, started out and not had a, either a not understood a lot or not didn't have a lot in terms of like samples or options or plugins or whatever. And then and then you know later you kind of accrue all of them and then you have all of them. Like I'm I'm in a position where I almost have every single thing I've ever wanted in terms of like capability and resources in terms of what I want to make for music. I got bitchin or uh, orchestra samples. I have guitars. I have amplifier really good like amplifier emulation and i understand i can record drum kits and I'm, I'm an okay drummer but i have drummers you know i have superior drummer like i have every single thing i've ever needed to do literally anything but that huge amount of possibility could actually be a giant hindrance in terms of actually creating something because it's like well, if i can if i have everything if i could do anything then what do i choose to do you know it's a difficult kind of concept to wrap around versus you know 11 or eight years ago when I, I had like a drum loop and I could use citrus presets. That limitation meant that I made the best of what I, out of what I could, could do. And some of those songs, despite being engineering disasters are actually still some of my best work just because the, my best and most creative expressions of making stuff work, you know, that kind of thing. So why seamless seamless was a, a gamer name that I used for stuff. And when I, when I actually, <laughs> um, my oldest YouTube videos are all gaming videos. They're all like Grand Theft Auto montages and um, Half-Life 2 Deathmatch videos and Crisis, the original Crisis multiplayer video videos and that kind of stuff. Like that, that's my that's my YouTube channel used to be. And then um, I was called Seamless. And then I started doing music and I'm like, well, I'm called Seamless. So I'm going to continue to be called Seamless. That's it. I can't rap. People in the chat tell me to rap. I'm not going to, I can't rap. Uh... Any tips on click removal? Okay, well, you got if you're doing it on a sample and like you make a cut and then it clicks, make sure that you're not cutting on something that's not a zero across. That is to say, there's no positive amplitude and no negative amplitude, but it's just zero. Or you can do a fade in. You can just make a fade in. You can fade in. That's kind of how you usually do that. Same thing with like automation clicking, because you can have. I was talking earlier about how um, if you automate the volume of the mixer channel, it's not going to be harsh. It's not going to click. You know, be snappy. But if you if you automated, say, the free filter on the on the low pass filter, and you automated sharpness, it would be one hundred percent sharp. There is no smoothing on that at all. And you can solve that by either in, engaging smoothing inside the controller linking interface, or you can fade it in. You know, like we just said. Why do I like complex tracks? Um, it's mostly a feat of engineering. 
because that's what I that's what I look for and what I like in music and and making music is making impressive feats of engineering, be it a an impressively loud mix or an impressively complex th- th- sound that I design. That's what I'm into. And that's why I like that kind of stuff. Mm. Do I listen to Obsidia? I don't know who that is. Would you work with Vila again? I didn't actually work with Vila the first time. Like I worked with her v- vocals, but like I have had no contact with Vila ever. And yeah, I work with her again. She has a nice voice. And she wrote rather okay lyrics for given like a day and a half to produce that. So she's rather she's rather an impressive individual. How do you split time between pr- producing, playing instruments, reading manuals, and learning software? Well, there's not, there's not really there's not really a split in there. Like that's all that's all the same thing. It's all making music. It's all like everything that I've done. I know how to play the guitar because I wanted the guitar in my tracks. And so I learned how to play guitar well enough to play guitar on my tracks. And like, I can't really play guitar by itself. Like, if someone gave me acoustic guitar and they're like, "Do you play a song?" Like, I wouldn't be able to. I'd be able to get a jam for a second, but it wouldn't be a song. It'd just be like weird. And then like, I would. All, it'd also be a lot of like, uh, atonal sort of dissonant stuff because I'm in the metal, and so I wouldn't really work out that well. But if I'm doing atonal atonal dissonant stuff, I could do that. Heartbeat, like that kind of thing. That's the entire reason why I can play instruments is because I wanted to have them in my songs. So like, that's it's. That's why I learned it so well. What am I going to make sounds for the intro uh, soon? I actually don't know if I'm going to do that. Like, um, I expected it, people to get a kick out of the intro that I did where I'm like, hey, I have an intro. Yay, cool. Like, oh, look, here, here, here's an intro. That's neat. There should be sounds. There was sound at some point. Yay, cool. Good job. Intro. Like, I thought it'd be funny, but I didn't know that people would find that funny. And now that I think about it, I kind of want to, like, make a new sort of just, like, comment commentary over every new every video that I use it in. Like, I think it'd be kind of funny. Apart from noise who I like to collab with? Nightwatch. If you don't know who that is, that's noise yet. So that's that was a joke. And um I don't know, feed me. Also spore, same person, John Gooch. Um do you ever try contact power plugins? The original East West libraries were actually contact plugins, which are kind of cool. Um, I've used contact itself and I've used, uh, I use shreddage. I actually tested that for uh, Zircon, the guy who made it. And uh, that was a lot of fun. I don't really use it f- f- on purpose, I should say. Guys, when is he doing the sound design requests? Um, I stopped doing sound design requests as primary videos just because people tend to ask the same stuff over and over again. And I kind of got bored of that. But um, I do them for the, the 30K and 40K and 20K and all that stuff because it's, it's like an event. It's a party. It's a good time. I don't really care what you ask about. Like, it's fine. It's just a good time. It's fun. So that's what, what I'm going to limit it to. Um, which, by the way, I'm at 35,600. So I'm about halfway between 30K and 40K. Uh, did you come up with a way of playing guitar live? Guitar and mini controls. Um, um, well... I could just plug a guitar into an audio interface and play a guitar live. I could do that. That's fine. But um, there are there are there's a thing called there's a thing called an industrial radio MIDI bass. Google that later. It's a bass guitar that has perfect MIDI tracking. It's really goddamn good, and it's also really goddamn expensive. One day it'll be mine, but for now, it is just a dream. Paying on Dead Mouse. Um, I actually there was a, this is there's there's a weird period. Um, when I made uh, Remember off my EP while I was making it, I got on the biggest Dead Mouse kick, like the hugest. Like I, I was, I had listened to his music kind of like cursory before, and but then I listened to it again, and I just had like this weird like sudden understanding of it. I was like, what? Some of this is really good. Like really, like uh, you guys, how do you? Does anyone know about this? I'm like, oh, it's Dead Mouse. Everyone knows about it, but like, so I got. Um, that's why I made remember is because that that's what it reminded me of. And like, it was just, it was, I've been having a lot of that recently about, about certain different styles of music. Like, uh, I don't want to talk about that. It's for about, it's about stuff that you guys aren't going to know about. Um, follow your harbor base design. How levels just for keeping the base sounds clean. EQ. And kind of keep a handle on your distortion. Have I used, ever used Nexus? Nope. Dude, that bass is like $5,000. That's what I mean by goddamn expensive. 
couldn't DJ professionally, but you're pretty sweet in the launchpad. Have you ever considered a launchpad set? Yeah, I thought about it. Like kind of a controller's performance set. I'm from a, I'm in a metal band, and so I'm used to a little. I'm not. I, w- I won't say a higher standard of performance because that's not that's not true. Like it's it's all performing, but I'm 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 used to a more specific and engaged kind of performance. Also, recently I saw some things like um I I, I mean I, I've known about Destroyed for a while, but I wasn't really into what they were doing. But then I also found recently that NetSky has a bitchin' live set. Like I'm really not in the I'm not really into NetSky's music either. Like it's, it's too liquid for me. But the live set was cool as hell. And like as much as I don't really want to have a band, I kind of want a band. So that's that's that. Will I ever use Vocaloid? I thought about that um, a while ago when I first heard about it. I thought it was a cool idea, but I have no real reason to. Consider making new disco. I kind of lump in new disco with like funk and funk based things like the chop where the kind of comp- composition and writing that that involves is a little beyond me. It's like I had such a, such a really hard time like the uh, the glitch hop track just like writing a funky rhythm was such a big deal for me like it wasn't easy. It wasn't something that I'm used to doing and like I really I do like the stuff though like I like pretty much everything Maddie's ever done and that's a lot of fun. But uh Yeah, so maybe at some point. Do you start making music from drums, chord progression or melody? What's your approach to building a track? Depends on the track. Depends on if I have an idea of what I'm doing. Codename Hurricane, for example. I pretty much knew that I was going to make that about the um, the B part of the drop. The drop wasn't a big deal, but it was about the B part. So I made I made the melody, the chord progression first. Then I made the chords, the big chords, big seven lines of chords. And then I made the drums. I made That was the first part I made that track. And that's because I knew what I was doing. I had the idea in my mind, and I went after it. If I don't know what I'm doing, if I have no clue what I want to do with the track, I will almost always start making a bass sound first. I'll make a bass sound. Then I'll make a drums, then I'll make some drums, and then I'll mix and master that, and then I'll build the rest of the track around it. That's how I do almost everything. Favorite childhood game? Descent. Specifically Descent 2. It's coming back, guys. Uh, what do you think about the idea of drum based real drums like Pendulum? I think it's hilariously underutilized. My idea of, of drum and bass with drums is Jojo Mayer's band. Nerve. I think it's called Nerve. Anyway, Jojo Mayer. Jojo Mayer is drum and bass with real drums. KJ Saka um, is a really impressive drummer, but like all the stuff that he's in is not impressive. Like he doesn't, like the recordings and the music are super lame for how good he is. And that, yeah. so, and then, you know, Jojo Mayer, his music is not lame. It's all about how awesome he is. So that's, uh, that's my opinion on that. I wanted to be more more of a thing, but I don't know that the uh, the scene or the fans of drum and bass or EDM are into that sort of stuff. Have I ever considered making music for games and film? I have actually made music for games and film. I've made music for a film that my uh, friends made called Abduction. It's a cool movie. And I'm actually working on uh, Descent, which is nice. I ever played one? If I ever played Quick One, Two, Three, and Four, I played Quick Two. It's about the last Quick I did. Seen was do a big room electric house. No, also that wasn't the question. Have I ever produced sounds of video games? That was the same question. Pizza or burger? Both. What do you think about big room house? Okay, that's a question. All right. Um, I was, I was really uh, bewildered by it when it when it became a thing. Like, because I'm big into electro, obviously, and I liked the first. I liked the early knife party offerings. I liked um, Rob Swire. And Gareth, Gareth, I think is is his name. Who's in that? Rob Swire mostly. But I, I'm into. I was into you know Internet Friends and 100 No Modern Talking, like those albums, and they're really good. But then, um, whatever album Elrad was on, like I was like, oh, it's the big track. Oh, it's cool. Oh, it's nice and new. Ah, nice and what drop is this? What is happening? Like that was my that was my introduction to Big Room House, and I was it was the biggest letdown I've ever heard in my life. And I have I have since come to an understanding of Big Room being, being that like its point in life is not to be a good personal listening experience. It's to be a good live experience. And I can kind of see how that makes sense. I had this explained to me by, by Brian, by BT. And it has to do with why people like hardcore, the genre. I don't like hardcore. 
I'm I'm about as let down by hardcore as I am Big Room House. And again, remember I told you earlier, I'm all about feats of engineering in in the music. I'm, I'm I am impressed by how the music is made and how it sounds alien and cool. And Big Room is like the antithesis of that. So, yeah. <laughs> Lots of opinions on hardcore. Yeah. Well, I'd do more streams of Roads Will Riot. Yeah, why not? Rage Valley. Gabber. Ugh. Fuck it. I'm not even going to try to expl de defend my distaste for that. Love from Dominican Republic. Love back. The sky is blue because when the light reaches the atmosphere, the wavelength that happens to get scattered the most is blue. Thank you for that. Someone tried to link something and that's not going to work. Uh, what sound preset for your... What sound preset for your... What sound preset for you find yourself using the most out of the collection you have made? Um, I tend not to reuse a lot of sounds. There's a couple of basic, like, Harmer stuff that I use a lot. Um, like... Phase Orb 19, for example. I like that sound a lot. And uh, I don't really... I don't really... No. <laughs> but anyway, like, for... for Like, again, I remember I'm big into, like, you know, the idea of the engineering production. So I'll often make a lot of stuff from scratch. And it's, it's also a decent, you know, exercise. But, like, a lot of times I'll reuse um, the sometime chords. I use those a lot for, like, electro-based stuff. Um, I, I have a lot, of, a lot of guitar tone presets that I use a lot. Uh, that, that makes a little bit more sense because I have the same guitar, so that, that's a bit, a bit different. Hey, did you like the show Neon Genesis Evangelion? I have seen it. I've seen both the English and the Japanese version, both endings. Even, uh, that show was weird. What sound preset do? What's your opinion on marshmallow peeps? I'm not big on marshmallows. I'm not, actually not big on sweets either. Like... I had this discussion with my mother the other day about how my teeth, I've never had cavities and it's not, not just because my dad's teeth aren't like indestructible, but because, um, I've just not big, been big on sweets. I do soda and stuff all the time, but like, like I don't do like ice cream and cake and candy and that kind of stuff. I like the stuff. I just don't like it enough to have it constantly. So will I ever make mainstream EDM? If I do, you're never going to hear about it. Let's put it that way. Uh, see what's for sample an elephant sound for bass. I guess I could just pitch down. Also, that's not a question. This is my family. It's part of my family. Let's see. This is my dad. This is my sister. Behind my sister, you can't really see, is this guy Greg, who's my sister's boyfriend. This is my dad's wife, Cynthia. This is my brother's wife, Stephanie. This is their son, Declan, my brother and his wife. And this is my brother. What? My brother. And that's me. The pillar of obsidian greatness right there. That's me. Seagulls' new name is Chompers. <laughs> I have had braces, though, because my teeth went out, went wildly out of whack when I was in middle school. Have you ever thought about doing leads tutorials? I've done a couple, actually. I've done how to lead. Go to my channel and search how to lead. I think I did three of them. Um, If you could be on any record label, any at all, probably Vision or Division, Savant already did that song. Uh, Forever Lord, you enjoy, do you enjoy hip hop? Yeah, I do like hip hop a lot. I hate most lyrics that are in hip hop. I hate almost all of them. Like maybe 96%. Because it's just such a huge crock of shit. All of it. Oh my God. I really dig Eminem a lot. Some of, it, some of what he says is a crock of shit, but a lot of what he says isn't a crock of shit. But like Drake? No. Do I have any favorite mixing plugins? I'm thinking about low end of the mix, bass fundamental for good use. Do you have any exciters and modul modulation plugins on Master Channel? I use Maximus 100% of the time. Oftentimes I use just one. Can you rap seamless? We've covered this. I know this isn't a question, but you're the reason I make music. I don't know what to do with that, but thank you. I, or you're welcome, I guess, but thank you. That, that feels nice. Do I like Tech 9? I do, I do kind of like Tech 9. 
I like Hobson. I like not, MC nine hundred foot Jesus. That that's pretty good. I would I would have Cohen sound for guests, but I don't think they'd want to be guests. Uh, can you break dance seamless? Kind of. There was a break dance class in high school. I didn't take it, but a lot of my friends did. Swag and stuff. Uh, how old am I? I'm twenty five. I'll be twenty six September. <laughs> can I can I rap? I guess so. Okay, people are getting some interesting ideas from stuff I'm saying. A lot. Mostly about the term crock of shit. I had the best high school. I did have the best high school. Let's talk about my high school for a second. Um, I, have, I, I think there are actually some, peop some kids that go to my high school right now that know who I am. So if you go to Pioneer Valley Performing Arts Charter School, middle school or high school, then this is for you. Um, that's where I went. I went to Pioneer Valley. Well, I went to Pioneer Valley Performing Arts High School. Uh, later, they, well, at the time they had a middle school, but it wasn't integrated. And then they integrated them. So then it became Pioneer Valley Performing Arts Charter to School. And that was located in, um, uh, well, at first it was located in Amherst or Hadley rather. And, or, well, I guess it was Amherst. And then they moved to South Hadley. Um, anyway, this was a performing arts school. Here's the thing about this school. It got it got it got interesting interesting um uh rep for being a stoner school because I mean what high school isn't but this school in particular and because it's all performing artsy and hippie and like pretty and visual arts stuff and plays and whatever the thing is though is that it gave you the impression that the school's like academic quality was lacking and no no let me tell you let me tell you how they did things at PVPA so. The, the day was split up into halves. It was split up. Like half of the day was academic stuff. And then the other half of the day was performing arts stuff. So you're thinking, oh, well, that's cool. Yeah, except that the school day was eight hours long. We went to school. We went to school at, uh, you know, eight, normal, normal time, like 8 a.m. And then we didn't get out until 6 or 4. Well, we got out, we got out at 4. And then if you were going to play or you were doing any kind of like extracurricular stuff, then you pretty much stayed the night. Like you stayed there until like 10 or like 8 or 9 or 10 or whatever to do whatever it is you're doing, like a, a black light theater show or a dance show or a play or whatever, which I did a lot of. I did not I was not personally in these shows. I was a techie. I did the sound tech stuff and also some lighting stuff, some lighting tech stuff, theater, theater lighting and theater sound. And this is actually part, this is actually where I learned most of what I know about engineering. Like I, they, they had, you know, big old boards and routing and microphones and all stuff. And like a, a lot of the actual physical technical aspects of recording engineering, I learned at PVPA. Also in the new building that they had in South Hadley, they actually had a recording studio. So I actually had a, they had an actual recording studio that we learned actual recording stuff in. We recorded songs and everything. It was badass. So like, that's why, that's why, uh, went to a school of racists. Racist. That's a reference to something that happened at PVPA. That if you ever want to know the definition of a crock of shit, look into that. That was a crock of shit. But damn. Anyway, um, that was the high school, and they had this thing. They had this thing called uh, Paideia. Paideia. What Paideia is is in between semesters, you know, the beginning of the second half of the year, uh, around Christmas after after Christmas break. Um, for about three weeks, they would you do you do paideia. What paideia is is you pick a thing to do, a performing arts thing, and then your whole eight hour day became about that one performing arts thing. And they had a bunch of options. They had like, oh, you could, you could do like rock climbing, which is weird. You could do fencing. I did fencing my first year there, freshman year. You could do up uh, the the play. You could do the dance. You can do um, like painting and drawing and video production and like stuff like that but they also had electronic music paideia otherwise known as techno paideia that's what they call it and this is where this is the class that i took where i was introduced to fl3 free loops 3 when i mentioned that my teacher gave me an option between fl3 or reason 2 that is when that that is when that happened that was 2004 and i took techno paideia every year ever since um also i actually kind of forgot what i was talking about about the whole academic thing uh they don't have grades 
at PvPA. They don't do the A, they don't do the A, B, C, D, F thing. That's not what they do. What they do is they have a pass fail system. You either pass it or you don't. And so that's like that's kind of you know wishy washy or whatever. But like when asked to quantify what passing means, they tell us that in order to pass something, you have to do the work up to a B level. And this is true for everything. So if you have to pass a class, you need to get a B in the class. Not like every other academic, public academic institution that you'll ever see in America where a D is a passing grade, B is a passing grade. Which means you can get a C and you'll fail. That's what that means. On the flip side, though, on the flip side, though, you could re- you could do revisions. You could read you could redo almost everything. Like if you fail a test, you could do it again. If you didn't, if you failed your homework, you can do it again. But you have to do it. Like if you missed it, that's a different problem. That's a new. That's a different. That's a different thing. So like it was it was a very well crafted system that meant that you had to do a lot of work, and you had to be good at it. You had to be right. I stayed five years, and so that's that. They also had AP classes. I took AP physics. That was fun. But um, it was a uh, it was a good time. The school is called Pioneer Valley Performing Arts. It's currently located in South Hadley, Massachusetts. <sighs> Spanish producer. I like Spanish people. You're nice. Are you in touch with any other famous producers? Uh, the most famous producer I'm in touch with would probably be, be BT. I've met some interesting individuals through him. Uh, Adam K. I've met. I talked to them. I didn't actually meet him. He's the only one that I've ever like actually met in person. Um... Yeah, my high school was like the greatest thing ever. Like it saved everybody. Like I would not. What would I have even done if I didn't go to that high school? I wouldn't be. I wouldn't do everything I'm doing right now. Like damn. Uh, gross beat up my voice. Not right now. What is it all about today? It's about stuff you're asking. Uh, see, most do I ever get recognized in public? I don't really go out in public much. And when I do, it's not really the places that would contain people that would know who I am. So no. What do I think of space places work? Dope. Uh, what about Savant? I haven't met Savant. I mean, I, I talked to the guy. He's, he's, he's neat. Yeah. Has anyone really been far even as decided to use even go want to do more look like? More like. More, look more like. I never get that right. People saying don't wait till college to do performing arts. And really it's true. Like, um... I mean, you should, if you're into it, like, it's hard to be into it. Like, my parents put me into piano when I was eight, and I hated music. I hated music and almost everything to do with it all the way up until I was 16 or 15, pretty much when I started using FL. In fact, the only reason why I really did that, the reason the reason why I went to PVPA, we really wanted to go to PVPA um, because it was a really, a really nice environment, and we basically used me being able to play the piano as an excuse because I really wasn't into any real performing arts. Like, my first year there was a huge waste of time. Like, I didn't do a play. I didn't do anything. Like, I did that in 10th grade. That's also when I found FL Studio. Like, I just wasn't into it. And it was mostly because I was forced into it as a kid. And, like, it was the right decision. It was the good. It was they. My parents were right to do that. But, like, I hated the fuck out of it. So you have to be really kind of careful how you approach this with kids with kids and younger people. And being, I mean, if you're already here, you're probably fine. But, like, if, if you're an adult and you're trying to teach your children how to be into music, then, like, that's... You gotta be careful about that. So here... Okay, being college for sound design. Okay, here's the thing about that. When I was in high school, I was looking for colleges to do the music thing. And, um... There are there some options, but the thing about going to music in college is that almost all of them require that you have a classical music education, which means you do music theory, you learn an, uh, an instrument, you go there, you basically are in a conservatory. Like, that's what you're doing. That's what, that's what music education in college means. It's changed a little bit. Like, um, Berkeley in particular, and, and I guess Full Sail. I don't know anything about Full Sail. It seems kind of scammy to me, but I could be wrong about that. I don't really know. But Berkeley, for example, Berkeley at the time was the only class that had a sound design degree, like a, a music synthesis degree. And that's where I wanted to go. I applied to Berkeley. I didn't get it. So I, I, I kind of sucked back then. So I, I didn't really find that surprising, but um, like that's, that was the option. And it kind of is still true now. Like regular colleges don't have music, like engineering degrees. You can go to, you can go do recording engineering. You could do like, you can go to like UMass Lowell, like a friend of mine did and learn about 
recording stuff, like recording bands, how to build studios, which he did too. Like, you, that's probably as close as you're going to get. And that's actually still a, a decent education to have, like how, to learn how to re- do recording and mixing and all that kind of stuff. That's a pretty big part of making any kind of music. So that's still helpful. But learning sound design in college is probably... <coughs> Because that's something you're going to find easily. And Berkeley is extraordinarily expensive. And living in Boston is extraordinarily expensive. So there's that. What's the worst DAW? I have no idea. Which do you feel is more, more fun? Remixing or original production? Fun. It's all kind of fun. It's all like the, the same kind of fun, you know? Just got to approach it differently. I don't really do a lot of remixes now. Although I was particularly plow, proud, plowed. I was particularly proud of my remix of the Skrillex track, the Bundem remix, because um, I thought it was it was real clever to take that rhythmic aspect because it was originally a six eight dubstep track, so it was one two three one two three one two three one two three, and then I turned it into a a four four D and B track. So I took the one two three one two three one two three one two three and basically cut it up into one two one two one two one two, and like I felt I thought that was good. There's this tendency for producers to do remixes these days that don't sound anything like the original production. They're they're basically a new track with like the vocals on it. Also, I liked my remix of um, uh, Subtle Hints that, for that contest that I forgot to submit that track for. But like, I think that's because I, I did. I, I tend to think of remixes as doing like a new genre. Like when me and Sean did the um, Hideous Remix competition, we took a dub uh, dubstep, a drum and bass track, and turned it into like a neuro electro track. And that was a lot of fun. That's how I view remixes. And I like I, I want it to be like an interesting version of the track because that's what a remix is supposed to be in my eyes. What people have been doing with it are basically like just different, just their own songs with the vocals on it. Like that people do that. <sighs> have I checked out Bitwig? I have not. Seamless, how or Steven, how can we buy lessons? I, he said he says Steven, but I read Seamless. And this is George asking me this. I'm pretty sure you know this, George. But he's probably asking so that he I, I can have a reason to a reason to plug it. So thank you for that. Um lessons are thirty dollars an hour, and you can like you have to email me, uh seamlessrg at gmail.com. It's in the description of this video if you're watching this on YouTube. And um tell me what you want to learn, and then I will give you my I'll give you a, if I can if I can do that, and I'll say like, okay, we can do this sort of thing. And then I'll do, I'll tell you I'll tell you what my what like what times I have open, but you gotta email me and we'll discuss it personally because it's different for every single person. Seamless, why did you post the over nine thousand video earlier today? Because I got over nine thousand Facebook likes. That's the joke. When's my birthday? September twenty sixth. How long, uh, uh, does anyone know any good resources for learning Cubase? I don't know. I'd never use Cubase. It's pretty good though. Uh, Cell Dweller and pretty much everyone else affixed to uses Cubase. So, have you ever heard of EQ? No. Is a bootleg a remix without permission? Question, question. My understanding of what a bootleg is, is you using b- basically a remix of without someone else's permission. A remix without someone else's permission and also a remix without official remix materials. So, like, if you went to YouTube and took and, like, recorded the Bundem track and then remixed that, that's about as bootleggy as you can get. And, uh... Also, like basically, an an un, an unofficial release of anything. So, like, if you were on a label and you and someone sent you, someone sent you like a finished track, like, oh, we're going to release this, and then you released it. That's that you're kind of bootlegging it. So, uh, that's my understanding of what a bootleg is. And people use that word wrong a lot. Yeah, the internet is quite good to learn Cubase. What's my social security number? It's a number. I find picture dysfunctional raps voice octave. Okay, you have to. Yeah, there's a button on picture. His question is how do I, he's he's basically limited to the octave, which is uh, this default mode. But if you turn on there's there's three buttons. There's there's the harmonic mode and then there's chord and then there's one that says octaves. If you click on that, then you can you have the whole range of of voices for for your option. That's what that's for. That's how that works. Do I like minimal? Yeah. So what? A little bit. What is an edit of a track then? It's an edit. It's mostly a remix. Like when people when people post edits of my tracks that they get out of FL, it's basically a very low a low effort remix because you're not actually um, 
doing much different to the track. Like what people will do, they'll make dubstep edits and they'll just turn down the track to 140. Or turn out the track to 140. And then the half time the beat. That's an edit. Do you enjoy smoking to herb? I do not. I mean, I might enjoy it, but I haven't. I just don't. I don't really care. Uh, advice is for people aspiring to be a producer. Produce. Make music. Like, uh, it's not, there's not like a producer pep talk I can give people. It's, there's not, it's like anything else that you want to do. You have to want to do it and then do it a lot. A lot. Like, I am as well known as I am from stuff that I started doing about two, two and a half years ago. Before that, no one, not a single person knew who I was. And I also didn't really do things that were that good. Like I did metal and even before, but before I did metal, I did this stuff. Like I was a drum and bass producer, but I was really bad for years. Like, so remember, like I've been producing since 2004. So it's 10 years that I've been producing and I've only started to get really known about stuff that I'm doing two and a half years ago. But that's also not to say that like I started producing being like, I want to be a producer. I want to make music. This is all I want to do. Like I, I was new and I was operating under the assumption that this was very much a hobby. It's not a hobby anymore, but back then it was very much a hobby. So treating it like a hobby means that shit takes longer. Also, the fact that YouTube didn't exist makes things take longer. Have I ever ghost produced? If I did, I kind of wouldn't be able to tell you. Um, should us producers be discouraged now that it'll be hard to penetrate the scene? It depends on the scene. I mean, shit is definitely harder now, but a different. It's a, a weird kind of hard. Like it's kind of like hard in the way that, like, oh man, Mozart wrote all the easy stuff. Like, and he really did. Like, Ode to Joy is basically the major key song. Like, that's that's that kind of stuff. That's what I mean by Mozart wrote all the easy shit. And a lot of the early dubstep producers that made, you know, dubstep a famous song that it is, they wrote all the easy songs. The basses are so not impressive, but I was impressed by them. Like, a lot of the, like, the most old That Sick tracks, like, were some of the stuff that I listened to, thought, man, that's really dope bass. I listen to it now, I'm like, man... That's a saw wave, <laughs> like just one. And so like for certain, for certain genres, not necessarily all genres, but for certain, for certain genres, um, penetrating the scene involves basically being a kill the noise where you come back, you come out with a totally ridiculous sounding sound that no one can figure out. And then you just are like, I'm, I'm here now. This is what I'm doing. Or Skrillex, you know, that, that way too. But like, if you're not doing that, then we come back. We come back to the idea. Uh, I can't really answer this question, and it's be- and I'm here because I didn't answer that question. I said I don't know. I make tutorials. I don't make music, and now I make music because I made tutorials. That's not really a a path I would suggest to people because it wasn't my plan to make music and sell it as a producer. It's my plan to make tutorials. That's what I wanted to do. And now, but now I'm seeing that I have the option to make music and sell it. So that I, so now I am. It wasn't really a plan. I couldn't have planned this if I tried. When am I going to upload the stream dream for launchpad performance video? Oh my god, I have to finish it. That shit's hard, you know? Like, I did the basic antics one, and that was a lot of difficulty. And a lot of the same problems I had with that, I have for everything else. So, like, it's just not easy to do that kind of stuff. Uh, how long average spend to try to each track? 30, 40 hours, like what George says. I'm not going to answer that question, but the answer is no. What do you think about the future of genres? There will always be genres. And people are, you know, there's, there's this interesting uh, idea people have about genres. They're saying, oh, why is it just music? You listen, listen to music. You like music, right? You like this thing. And there's very clear reasons why we have genres. And I'm not saying, like, the difference between, like, folk music and black metal. Like, although those, it's funny that I mentioned those two particular genres. But, like, that, that there's a reason why we do, don't just have those categories. Those are really, those are really categories. I'll talk about genres. Like... Consider, consider, actually, let's consider this. Um, there was a comment on uh, my, my track Momentum where someone says, what the hell genre is this? And, like, people people are, would usually respond being like, oh, no worry, did you just listen to music? Just shut up, man. Or, or be like, oh, it's electro or dubstep. But, like, electro is, is technically true. But if you looked up electro, you're not going to find stuff that sounds like that track. And that's why genres are important because – we have people find like a song that I made or a song that like Maddie makes or a song that um, Skrillex makes like the dubstep stuff, bro step or whatever. They hey, hear a song and they like that song and they want to hear more. 
they don't, they don't just want to hear more of that song from Skrillex, although they do. They want to hear other people who do that kind of song. Like when people hear um, like m- like metal, they go, "Oh, what kind of metal is this? Oh, is this kind of metal? Cool. Let's go find thirty other bands that do this exact same thing, so I can get a little variety, but in this th- very sh- small area that I like." That's what genres are for, and that's always going to exist because there are going to be people who make something, and the people are going to say, "Wow, it's really cool." I want to hear more of that and say, what kind of music is this? Oh, it's EDM. Thanks. That helped. So, generous. <sighs> Have you ever made a chill out, down tempo, liquid, or any calm tracks? Yes. No, they're in anywhere. Uh... <laughs> yes, I do pretend to be fine. Be fine. As if I don't someone to, don't need someone to ease my mind. That's a thing I do. Uh, would we be able to send out uh, send you our songs so we can give constructive criticism on it? Okay, so so um, here's the thing about people sending me tracks. Um, I know that I kind of ask for it because I I basically made myself the like you know the teacher. I'm the guy that helps that kind of thing. And I do want to help. And so I don't begrudge people sending me tracks, but like there's a very low probability they'll actually have time to listen to your track enough to like analyze it and then give you criticism. And it's not because you, people, people think I'm like, oh, it's not that hard. You want to listen to your track and give you criticism. It didn't take that long at all. But like, and you know, if it was, if, uh, if, if like me from 10 years ago sent me a track and said, Dude, listen to this track and give us a criticism on it. I would not know what to say to him other than, like, learn how to produce. <laughs> like, because that's what would basically be true. Like, oh, man, you know, okay, it could be louder. Like, it makes this weird. Like, too many lows. Like, your, your high ends are super sharp. You turn it down. Like, what are you mixing on? You know, broken headphones? Like, your sample choice is odd. Like, I could totally hear it. This is, this is, these are nothing but citrus presets. This is, like, a really bad melody. This note's wrong. Like, this progression's awful. Like, it would just be the most disheartening thing in the universe. And then to like, to how do I help him? Well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to give him a dissertation on how to learn how to produce. Like, that's why, like, that's a lot of work. Like I do that for people. When I, when I do lessons with people, like they, they'll do that. They can get track and be like, okay, well, what's wrong with this track? I'm like, okay, well, how much do you know about side chaining? Like that happens sometimes. And it's not like I'm saying, oh, you're stupid. You don't know what side chaining is. Cause I didn't know what side chaining was, but like, it's, it's a very, it's a very big time and effort sink. Look at this shiny. <laughs> time and effort sink. So that's why I can't do it when ninety people send me a new track a day. Um, on the other hand, I do do I do one of the per- the Patreon perks that I have above my Patreon is that you can send me a track and I'll give you a review for it. But that's like a perk from you know donating money to me. And I'm not saying you pay me to listen to your tracks. It's a perk for donating to me. Don't donate to me if you don't just want to support what I'm doing. And don't do it just to have. It's not a service. That's not what that is. That's not what that's for. But that's what that is. And it's real difficult. That's so that's that's my thing about tracks. And like, I'm not gonna be the guy that's like, dude, don't like publicly be big. Don't don't send me your tracks. I'm not gonna listen to them. I don't want to hear your tracks. Like, why do I care? That kind of thing. I know why I should care because I should care because I get a lot of people that send me tracks being like, look what I've done now that I've learned some things from your from your channel. Oh, you, you taught me about Harmer. Now I made this cool sound. I'm like, oh, I, I learned about mixing and from from this video from your from your from your making of. And now I've I've made lots of improvements. Here's this song. You'd be happy for me because I've learned from you, and I am totally happy to hear that. Like, that's awesome. There's not a lot of things that feel as good of people being like, dude, you've made a direct and noticeable impact on my quality of life because now I don't suck as much. Like, that's a thing that makes me feel really good. It doesn't change the the fact that there's still just 24 hours in a day. So that's what's up with that. Am I going to open up FL Studio or show something today? Probably not, honestly, because a lot of the stuff that I've, I'm answering don't involve practical demonstrations of things. Do I get paid by image line? No, I already answered that, but you weren't here for that, so no. Uh, could you put out that mixing mastering tutorial soon? Okay, let's talk about why I don't do mixing and mastering tutorials. Um... I, I will do it for specific examples. Like I do the mixing the mixing and masterings of like Codename Hurricane and I'll do that for every track on the EP, by the way. And like that kind of stuff. But that's why I don't do it. Because that's that kind of stuff really only is applicable in very specific examples. Like like if I were to if I were to like bring it down to low enough level to be like, okay, well how do I, what's the process of mixing and mastering every single track? It's gonna be something like, okay, 
route your stuff, EQ your stuff, compress your stuff until it sounds good. Like that's what's gonna that's what's gonna happen. Because there are there are very there are very common but still varied case by case things that happen that makes what you do to a track different for every track. Like so, like you know, this one might be more bass heavy. So like we got to talk about how we're gonna do, how we're gonna mix the bass for it. We're gonna this one might uh, have vocals on it. So we got to talk about how we deal with that or like the side chaining and you know, the, the mix and the, the tempo, which you wouldn't think matters, but it kind of does, and all these things. And so like. I can only talk about it in not only a case by case, but a very like modular th- th- way, th- way, which is why I've done, I did the, the tutorial on how Maximus works just on a very general level so that you can kind of see how that applies to the, the mastering process and uh, mastering and mixing and what do they mean? And like, uh, so like, yes, compressed with Winwar, Winwar. I use 7Z, but like, that's why I don't do mixing and mastering tutorials is because it's not it's not like a sound design tutorial where it's like here's a sound and here's precisely how you make this sound. This is the only way you can ever make this one sound. It's gonna be the same no matter what. Like that's what that kind of tutorial is about. Mixing and ma- uh, yeah, I, I explained it. That's enough. What happened to Amon Records? Uh, there were some money problems with PayPal and licensing, and we're dealing with that. So that's why that's what happened to Amon Records. Uh. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Uh, are, is compression just changing the volume? Yes. Yes, it is. You should do your own vocals. No. If you make a new song and you come to a certain part where you don't know how to go on, what do you do? You don't. You either, you either like force yourself to come up with something and not do anything else until you do, which is awful, by the way, or you'd make a new song. Just don't bother save it you know keep it come back to it later maybe get a new idea but just work on something else uh did you ever go into the fidelity biz- the fiddly business of creating your own samples layering snares to make the one i sample snares uh, i did once and it's weird it's interesting but i have 85 snare samples i'm not gonna use anything else except for when i do i, mean, I don't use them all the time for everything it'd be weird if i used au5's huge super snares for like a minimal drum and bass track have I ever used machine or an NPC? No, but I kind of want to. They're just a little bit too expensive for me to be kind of like, I wonder what it's like. But I am sort of into into them. Like, and the only reason why I would use them is because of the, the pad configuration and also the pad types. The fact that they're called pads. The difference between, say, a pad and a button, which is what the launch pads are made of. Launch pads are made of buttons. And what buttons are are things that you have to push down and hit a little switch for it to know that you hit it. Pads use what's referred to as transducers, which are effectively little microphones. And they're triggers. Trans, they're, they are MIDI transdu- trigger transducers, transducers. And they listen for impact. And when you make an impact, that's when it knows what happens. The pads themselves don't move. They are they are little... They're just there to so that you're not like whacking a microphone filament yourself. But like you're just like... Doing that to a pad, like the, the, how they basically the interaction between this thing and the microphone is more or less the same way that the pad works, and as a result of it being something that can hear, that can hear difference in amplitude, you get velocity sensitivity, all kinds of good stuff. But also, it's fast. Like the button, the buttons on the launch pads. Yeah. Mm. The buttons on launch pads. Like I could hit it. There's no sensitivity on a launch pad. I mean, launch, this is why launch pads are cheap, by the way. And I'm not saying this is a bad thing. It's just that they're cheap. And, like, there's a little button that I have to, like, have to push it down before it knows that I did it. And so there's a little bit of latency ascribed to that. But there's latency ascribed to your, how long it takes your finger to get down there. Like, doing that. I've measured it once. Like, I've measured, I recorded the sound of my finger hitting the thing and when the sound actually happened. Because I can run an incredibly low latency with my, my, my computer setup. And it still added up to something like 14 milliseconds before the sound happened after I hit the thing. So, like, that's that's a lot. Especially when you're trying to finger drum, that's kind of unacceptable to me anyway. So, that's that's why that's why a machine and, like, the MPC in particular um, would be a better alternative for those specific things. Bring my cat over for us. Cats are not allowed in the basement. Do I use crack software? I have used crack software. Uh, let's, I'll put it this way: I don't, I don't, 
I pay for everything, every single, every single thing. I pay for everything that I use. Everything you've ever heard, any track that exists online, that's mine. I have paid for. That's what's up. Can I talk about space laces bases? I have actually in the past, like not in this video. I did, a, I did a sound design tutorial once. I didn't, really, I didn't really do a very good job, but that's um, what's up. Seamless wherever I go on tour, maybe. Uh, dear Seamless, recently I started a track with some respaces and hardware and FM book and stuff like that. The problem is I need a wobble there and when I add one it sounds too lame. Any idea how to glue it with the rest? There's a lot of ideas. So, I mean, remember how remember that mixing and mastering thing I'm talking about? Like, this is part of that. This is where the answer the answer is EQ it and compress it. Like that's the direction you're going to go, but like what specifically you do in the EQ and with the compressor will vary wildly between what your sounds actually are. So like, that's why that's actually why stuff like multiband compressors are pretty neat because they're pretty, um, if it in theory, and I'm not saying this is right, but in theory, if you had enough bands, you would never really need to EQ anything because you're pretty much ensuring that they, everything fits into one little profile forever. But that's a theory again. Um, but that's the answer, basically. You EQ it so that it sounds like it belongs to the other thing. And your, uh, how to, and your uh, massive, and your how to base massive video number eighty. Did you create? How did you create the build up? I don't know what I actually did. Um, that might have been a place a placeholder build up that I took out of Leviathan. Um, the Leviathan uh, sample pack has a lot of risers. And I believe I took one out of that. Seamless. Take off your glasses. That's not a question. FL logo on Launchpad. Yeah, how about that? There are 10 of these, I think, total. And I have one of them. That's not a Launchpad S, though. That's one of the, that's the older version. Does your music often complain that my mother is too loud? No, my mother and my music are on pretty good terms. Do you prefer delay to a delay bank? Delay bank. Are you a real ass OG? I'm not, though I try to be. Uh, let's go to Africa to play massive native instruments. <laughs> You're funny. Seamless, lend me your beard and my axe. Might be a stupid question, but is it cool if I sample sounds from your tutorials? All right, so there was actually kind of a problem, a problem with that recently. Um, uh, someone uploaded onto EDM.com a glitch hop track that had a lot of sounds from my my glitch hop track, the one that I made track from scratch. The thing is though, is that it did, he didn't just rip the drop, like because I have a preview of all my SoundCloud. That's, that's that's the only recording of it that there is, except for all the times that I played it in the track from scratch previews, the playthroughs at the beginning and the end of the video. And there's also lots of um, lots of uh, little moments where I was designing the sounds, and I have a feeling the guy probably took a lot from that. And I wouldn't have cared so much. I would have noticed, but I wouldn't have cared so much if it weren't for the fact that he used the phrases, the exact phrases that are actually in the song. Like, and he didn't. It, I mean, it's it's covered up with a whole bunch of stuff, but it's very much there, and it's very much the same patterns. So, like, that's why that's where there becomes a problem. Um, Basically, if you're if you're gonna sample some stuff out of stuff I use, make sure that they're not things I actually use in one of my actual tracks because it, I'm not gonna find out about it, but someone else will, and then they'll tell me, and then I'll find out about it. Like that's how I usually find out about these things because it's kind of illegal. So be careful about that. Uh, what rate is Ubuntu? I I don't know what that means. What do I look like without glasses? I don't know because I can't see. What if I what if I sampled you in the live stream? I just explain that. Uh, did you get that song removed? It doesn't look like it's there anymore. Probably um, fixed. Uh, I fix has contact with them because they're 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 promoting people so they they have contact with the edm.com people and i basically told them about it and i said you have a contact with them here's all the stuff here's all the information and whatever and i guess they handle it so cool can we slice your voice for me tutorials and use them as vocal decks have a nice day hey, go for it you have beautiful eyes thank you that wasn't the question but thank you ubuntu is the best i don't know what that means still i mean i know what ubuntu is but like i don't know what that means in this context 
Is there any sounds that you would say are just lame, like a side wave that's just LFO'd? Um, the only thing that I don't like that I actually find that I think is lame in sounds are when you can hear continuous effects. Like when you can tell, not so much when you can tell what the effects are, because I mean, at this point, I can tell what a lot of effects are. But like, I mean, like, um, if I were just to put on a really obvious phaser on something, like a DJ phaser, like DJ effects, like a DJ phaser effect is the worst sounding thing in the universe to me. Not just because I think the phaser sounds stupid, but like, but that kind of thing. If I hear that like on a continuous phrase of bass and it just goes all the way down, I'm going to focus more on that than I am the actual bass and the sound. There's ways to deal with that. Like you can cut up the bass, sample different parts of it so that it's moving around, but like it moves in different directions and different points in time and like that kind of stuff. So like there's, there's, that's the sort of stuff I don't like. But I mean, because you can use... What I mean, you were describing, but what you're describing is kind of a basic sound, and like you can use basic sounds to great effect. You can do your LFO sine wave or LFO saw wave, and you can still use it and have it be effective. You know, it might not be terribly impressive, but it's still good. You know, you could be good with it. Seamless. I bought your EP. Well, EP. I bought your EP. Seamless in caps. Thank you very much. I'm super duper appreciative of that. Still on the question. Having a hard time matching melodies and vocals. How do you do? How do you try to do that? So, having a hard time matching. Do you mean like making a melody that sounds good with vocals, or do you mean like literally recreating the vocal, the melody, the melody of the vocal? I, I'll ask you both. So, making a melody that fits with vocals, don't do that. Like, don't. Like, I have when I did um when I did uh, Death Blow, which had Tellers vocals in it. Um, I actually did not in the part where he's actually melodic during the during the drop. Um, there doesn't, there's a melody like right at the very end, but I keep it quiet and down like a lot because it, it's about the vocals. Like the vocals are with the melody. The vocals are what's bringing the part together. So like don't interfere with them. Don't do that. But if you're trying to figure out like what the vocals melody is, this is as a result of a process referred to as ear training. Ear training is when you train yourself to, uh, detect intervals. It's not a way to just know what notes are. Like if I just play a note by myself and be like, oh, that's C, that's not a thing that happens. Some people can do that either through a genetic abnormality or for actual training and memorization and just they are just around music forever. And you could do that, that's fine. But when I'm talking about your training, I mean like I know that from C to G, if I, if I were to hear that, even if I don't know that it's C or G, I could hear the first note and the second note and I know that's a fifth. And then I could hear a note after that and know that that's like a third or I could hear a note after that and I can know that that's a two. If you can, if you can figure that out, if you can identify, if you can identify intervals as a result of hearing them, it doesn't matter what note you're on. You can recreate the melody. So you just find, okay, that's, that's cool. What's the first note? Then you just like play the note with the other note, and then you know what note it is. But then if you know all the intervals, you can hear, okay, cool. If I know that this from the first note to the next note is a fifth, then if I start on A, then I know that the next note is E. That's ear training. And if you uh, Google ear training there's actually a, a couple of websites that help you they do like they do like a uh, little ear training tests they'll play a tone and our tone and then they'll say what is it and then the, there's options you pick it and then they'll tell you if you're right or wrong like that's just do that a lot and eventually you'll be able to hear a melody and like like oh that's actually a really cool melody i think i want that and you can just write it yourself just from listening to it and this is also a good way to have a sound in your head or a melody in your head and be like i want what is that damn what is this melody and like instead of instead of trying to like individually eke out what each note is and moving around because it's wrong, and then inevitably getting the whole thing wrong because the fact of the act of hearing the other note through what your melody was in your head, you could be like, okay, that's a one, that's a one, two, three, and then like a five, and then a six, and then a seven, and then a one again, and then another one, and then this octave, and then oh, that's a that's a major three, and like and like that kind of stuff. That's what your training does for you, and it's super duper handy, super duper handy. What do you think of modern pop music? I think it's poppy. Is that a pogo wood stick? This is a chopstick, man. <laughs> is it wrong to have days where you just don't feel like making anything? Of course, not constantly. Just put certain certain days. Yeah, I mean, people go through like months where they can't do shit. Like that's that's a, that's a thing that happens. If you want something to become very loud, would you compress it individually or with a multi bit compressor or the master? Which way is more effective? Depends. It depends. There's not really a rule, honestly. And uh, honestly, if you want to make something louder, uh, compression is one very simple way of doing it. But that's not all. That's not always the, the, the way. Oh, I don't do mastering and mixing tutorials. Yeah. Uh, seamless high. Why not use Apple stuff? Or are you not good? 
uh, <laughs> that's an interesting way of asking that. Um, either you're saying apples are not good, or you're just saying that I'm not good at use apples. I don't, I don't use Apple stuff because I'm a gamer. That's really all there is to that. Um, my parents are both IT professionals. They're, they're programmers. They've always had PCs, and so I, I, I was nat- I naturally, you know, became very interested in computers, and so I became very interested in computer games. And only recently was it really a thing that apples can play most any real modern popular game. So if I'm going to have a machine, it's going to be a PC. And that's why I have PCs. But in terms of like, in terms of like using like an Apple, like I've used Macs, you know, in college and school and stuff like that. Like that's, that's, uh, um, they're all Macs. All of them are Macs, but there's no real reason to like, it's mostly a marketing thing that Apple and the, the Mac platform has, has accomplished to make it seem like you need a Mac in order to do professional stuff. It's mostly an image thing. Cause again, we make all kinds of, we make all kinds of things about how like, Oh, all dolls are the same. We just do certain things differently. And we, the, the audio engine thing, like there's a lot, there's a huge amount of misinformation that exists to make people think one thing is better than another one. Really? It's not, it's the same, but Outside of all that, I play games, so I need a, I need a PC. Like, that's that. When uh, running a track, do you, like, stick to one genre or fuse multiple genres together? I do whatever I think sounds good at the time, which sometimes could be only just one thing or sometimes could be a lot of stuff. Fixed tend to be a fan of mixing genres, so I do that a lot now. Fruity phaser, sweet frequency. Is there some, is there some set frequencies to match the phaser to beat? No, you're just gonna have. To, I mean, yeah, but you're gonna have to figure them out by from ear. Guy asked me how to make sound for a song. I have no idea what uh, uh, song that even is, so I don't know idea. Is FL Basics dead? No, no, it's not. Uh, have I ever made a song dedicated to a special someone? Yep, I totally have. Uh, I made my girlfriend in high school some songs. Uh, I made some people I know online some songs once or twice. Um, that's I haven't done that in a long time though, so I not, not any, any time recently. <laughs> Actually, we're about done here, so before I leave, I'm gonna play the song I made for my girlfriend. <laughs> You're not gonna expect this at all. I gotta find it. Uh, mine. It was pretty bitching. I kind of every time I listen to it. Like it, that relationship relationship kind of died in the fire, but I like the song and I kind of want to remake it with real instruments. Oh, what do I mean by real instruments? Well, well, here we go. This might be kind of loud, so here comes this.
So yeah, I made that for my girlfriend. Um, that wasn't the FL Slayer that made that, by the way. That was a sample pack of guitars. Uh, it was really old. It's a sound font. Um, when did I make that? 2008? Yeah. But anyway, every once in a while I think about remaking that with an actual guitar, because that was pretty good. Um, it's going to be interesting to watch that on YouTube later, because I know that the video and the audio is not going to be in sync. So I'm going to be headbanging and stuff. It's going to be out of time, but whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah, so that was good. I did make that in FL Studio a long time ago. Um, anyway, I'm done. I got to pick up my roommate from work. So uh, that concludes today's. Tomorrow, I'm going to do a track from scratch stream. I'm going to try to. So uh, if you have any questions about any of this, let me know. And as usual. Have a nice day.